in. Nice. We're ready to go. Welcome back to the Cathode Ray Podcast. Our next episode here discussing our week, discussing retro, and of course, discussing Cathode Ray Tubes. My name is Lewis Ezra, and I'm joined by my good friend, Steve Nutter. Steve, how's your week been? How you doing, buddy? You looking well. Oh, thank you. Totally uh, tubular to keep on the tubing <laughs> and uh, 40-year-old man Ninja dad turtles. jokes. There okay. we go. Ninja. I'm doing great. Yeah, I've been uh, sticking to my exercise regimen mm. for literally... Man, it's like six weeks now, mm. and I've gone every day besides like four days out of that span that something's come up to just prevent me. It's like a funeral. <laughs> sure. So you've been doing the, so, yeah. uh, the yoga, right? Not just any yoga, the wrestler's yoga. Wrestler's yoga, that's right. DDP yoga, baby. <laughs> Disc one, so there's two discs. How many different exercises are there? So there's a lot, like, uh, if I can get this thing open. You know, like there's actually four discs, and the one I do on this one all the time is called Fat Burner right there. <laughs> That's the one I do. So there's some of them that are like ridiculous. I mean, this stuff is for people that are, it can be, there's yoga in there for people that are really out of shape, you know, that have lost hundreds of pounds and can barely maybe bend over. And, so there's a lot of things geared towards that. So there's stuff that obviously I have no, I, I, I can do things like that. So I just, it's not segmented for me on some of those DVDs, but hmm. uh, the other one is up there in the player right now. See, it's not, a, okay. I did and that is it this like, morning. Is it chapters? Like did it, each yeah, one it's just, chapter well, everything. it's like segmented. You just pick the workout on the DVD. Sure. And then you go to that chapter and then you, can... and then he starts yelling at you, the wrestler DDP. Yeah. He goes, get your position to the diamond cutter. Ah! <laughs> Hulk it up. How long is each exercise? I know you're you cussing at me right now, but it's good for you. We need That's Steve like yoga. Is. That's what we need. We need CR. <laughs> I, know, I, I actually thought yoga. about what if I uh, got to the point where I just live streamed my workout, just the 30 minutes of me doing it. <laughs> but the problem is I do it in my boxer shorts. I don't like to wear anything else. That's why I like doing it in the house. But... <laughs> Only um, fan Steve, yeah. Okay, yeah, there it. we go. That's the, the premium tier on Patreon. That's <laughs> that's where you give money Ooh. so people will watch. <laughs> Ooh, that would be scary. But uh, we'll see. I'm going to continue with it. I'm dedicated mm -hmm. to doing it. And uh, it's really, it's about the only workout thing that's ever kind of oh. clicked with me. So I think if you wanted to do maybe a little sketch, uh, you want to bring back some of your sketches. I think a yoga with a sketch... But instead, you're lifting a CRT and you're using it. Huh, 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 huh. CRT workout. Huh, yes. Huh, huh, huh. You gotta, and if, yeah, I've yeah. got to get myself strong enough to where I could like balance upside down off of two 20 inch PVMs, yeah. you know, like a, <laughs> hold myself up and be like, yeah, you know, upside down, inverted. Maybe I could just I've, do a video trick, you know, editing trick to make myself look like I'm actually have to call Mason for that one. I'd like to, um, I have this friend of mine and he's one of these insane army dudes who's in the CrossFit and everything. And part of his personal training regime is uh, his alternate exercises. They have some big bag. Uh, I don't know. It looks like a like that thing you put your feet on the poofet, as we eloquently say in English, <laughs> but like a real big heavy version. And you've got to like lift it up and carry it across the room and put it over your head 10 times or something. So I think some version of that with a CRT, like one that's already going to be thrown out and there's Steve going, huh, huh, and then lifting it over your head to have this montage shots. Oh, would be so funny. <laughs> the CRT I, workout. When, um, when the Olympics were going on, I was like, man, there needs to be like the CRT Olympics. Yeah. yeah, yeah and yeah. if, like shot put a tube yeah <laughs> oh dude that's so funny the, sh the crt olympics and then you could do it a ddp style so you go like you push it up goes over your head then there's a shot to you in the camera going <laughs> yeah and then just doing an ultimate crt yeah. choke like seeing how that's far right. you could throw it so that's uh man yeah if i just had if i just had some friends in real life that were around me <laughs> i need to become friends with some of these college kids mm. that would actually be into making these videos but uh every college kid around me is too busy right now getting ready for school and drinking but we'll talk about that hey later. kids 
Hey kids, do you want to hey, come we'll and film come. A, a fat old man with a niche hobby? Do you want to come? <laughs> hey kids, <laughs> who who wants to be an intern? <laughs> <laughs> no pay, baby. Free internship. <laughs> I'll give you a letter of recommendation from Retro Tech Incorporated <laughs> uh, letterhead. So uh, yeah, let's let's take a quick second here i think hmm. before we go and let's just mention this new thing that dropped on twitter like it's is less than i was looking at the timeline it's been only one day mm -hmm. and it looks like they've jumped on and started an instagram account and a tiktok account but i think twitter has the most action so far from them and that's this mars the mars right. teaser right the mars fpga so it's it looks so far, I, I, I don't have the complete knowledge, we're sort of talking a little bit out of our bums here, but it looks like a some sort of replacement for the DE10 Nano, not a drop-in, but the functional equivalent, if that's what we're thinking of. Some sort of baseboard that we could build the next generation we. I say we. There's really <laughs> smart people. We, yeah, us. <laughs> us, yeah, like I'm doing it. Uh, that the community, that the developers in our community could build the next version uh, of the Mr. Framework on top of. What do you know about it, Steve? Well, I'm just looking at the stuff that's been uh, posted so far. It does look like something that's going to be a Mr. Style of technology because Mars is an acronym for Multi-Arcade Retro System. Okay, uh -huh. so that's what Mars is standing for. Now, they've just teased some hardware photos uh, and a lot of them are around this titanium chip. I'm guessing that's the FPGA, mm. uh, which is different. Uh, the TI-180 FPGA, they've do, they've listed a lot of specs here. So if you are interested, you can go see a couple of the posts of how uh, what it says about the TI-180 specs. And then actually in the same thread, they give the DE-10 nano specs. So from what I can tell here, uh, a lot of these, it's an increase in specs, right? <laughs> yeah, that seems. To <laughs> and then be another it. spec sheet, and ju and just some more teasing stuff. But um, it's definitely based around this titanium TI one eighty M four eight four development kit. Uh, sure. So it's really fresh, really new. Uh, it's definitely exciting to see, I guess, something different come along too right that's always exciting to see um so I they could just speculate. one hey one yeah. minute ago they said they can do 4k output right at 444 literally while we're talking they just while posted we're talking that. i see that too that I, I see that post as well so look going over some of the specs and wildly speculating on what some of these uh specs might be so up to yeah 4k at, at uh 444 60 hertz um and not only is the fpga faster but also it appears that many of our add-on components are integrated in so we're seeing uh, 128 megabytes of sd ram if i understand that would be the equivalent of your your add-on ram uh already having user io so snack is going to be there already uh so integrating a few of these and did any of these posts mention the price or they haven't got to that yet did you see any price? Do, I have thing? not seen anything like that on the price, but it would be interesting while we're sitting here. Uh, maybe mm. I can find, I mean, surely maybe there's a price listing for just that FPGA, I guess. Oh, and then take it from there. And then you could, we could uh, take an assumption from there. Uh, but I don't see them listing anything. And there's a lot of other hardware on there. So that's not, you know, that's not saying anything about the price. We don't really know. But no, it definitely would, as you just mentioned, uh, take up and integrate a lot of those things you're buying externally right now or that we have with our mm -hmm. Mr. Setups. It looks fascinating. And uh, there's, there's a so it's interesting the way the communities are going, because there's also this is it looks like a one effort in one direction to create a new board that has everything on there to sort of be the new mr version 2.0 for the future and I, I think what i don't quite understand yet is the business model and structure 
of this project. So the D10 Nano was popular because it was a development board created by Intel to spur and inspire FPGA development. And it seems to have done that. I mean, if uh, it'd be very interesting to know what the Intel people think about the Mr. Community because their D10s are selling out all the time, but not everyone is a developer. But by creating such an ecosystem, many people have become developers and now the D, you know, FPGA programs become a thing. Okay. Um, yeah, you're right. And so what's the, who's behind, I guess I want to know what's the company, what's behind, obviously there's a company well, producing the FPGA, but you know, where does it go from there? I think that's a great point because I'm going to tell you something here that might blow your socks off. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, so let's think about it. The DE 10 nano was, and still is used a lot in, uh, all over the place. It's used in like schools and things. So I believe just that connection kind of helps the price come down. Right. And, uh, like you said, Intel's purposefully not, it feels like they're not just blowing the price out, you know, like, uh, like the graphics card markets or something was, where it's just like up and up and up and up every time they come out with a new batch. Uh, This, however, I did find on DigiKey, you can buy these development kits of this TI-180, which is the TI-180-484. There's 92 in stock. One costs 825 US dollars. That's the titanium FPGA. That's the whole, it's a whole development kit. So it comes with the FPGA and it's it's like a kit it's got uh it's got hardware and stuff in it so it's not just the chip but that's the whole development kit right there it's a lot sure. of stuff a lot of cables a lot of everything interesting so we don't know so, the, pr- the the pricing yet uh we yeah. don't quite i think we would need to, to speak somewhat because it sounds like there are, there's some people in the community who are quite knowledgeable about this already um, so we can't thing, assume yeah. anything though about price because they've not said no. their price. They may have special ways to get around that. That may just be that development kit that costs. That was literally me just here googling that, mm. finding it on DigiKey, and that's their price for it, their development mm. kit. So the things I'll find interesting as well is part of the D10 Nano. It was made uh, the, the, sort of it had backing of big companies. And I, I don't know who's actually making the Mars, and I just hope they are a company that has production facilities. I mean, what I mean is the capacity, sorry, is the word I'm looking for. Um, because it was very interesting that, 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 that Intel uh, was able to be behind all this. And another thing is, look, I think I'm a little bit scarred and a little bit wary after our last uh efforts with pixel fx and seeing how bad marketing could be and i think i just want i just hope that mars they're doing all this teasing just dropping little things all of a sudden there's just a tweet that says 4k output at 444 love it great that's an excellent thing can we have less of the marketing <laughs> fucking bullshit and can you just say it uh, no but no way lewis everybody wants to be every all the cool kids want to market their products like analog does right yes. Mis- mysterious and they're just trying to build a hype train mm-hmm. around a product probably if, if uh, this thing is as good as you think if this thing is as amazing as it seems the hype will build itself you don't have to do all this mysterious shit on us so please, 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 because then well, you start building mysterious stuff. People start looking for uh, flaws, and it's not just ah, ah. But maybe I've maybe I'm just scarred, and I need to talk to a <laughs> therapist. And you know, well, you you definitely need to talk to your therapist. But this is true. As far as this marketing stuff goes, uh, we have to. I mean, I have to call out Mars too because they used a clip of Schwarzenegger from oh, a gif. I mean, go. even if it's okay. a gif. Yeah, they again, same thing. They used a gif of Schwarzenegger uh choking from lack of oxygen on Mars in the lovely film uh Total Recall. So mm. 
Right, so they're the using the Mars thing. thing and they're using a lot of clips from different movies and uh, pop oh, yeah. culture that involve Mars. So, all right, all right. We'll give them the benefit of the doubt. Benefit of the doubt. But hey, you could right. say you heard about it first, maybe here. I don't know. Maybe. I think that's an interesting platform. And so we're seeing the market going. So on one hand, maybe this is a, it seems like this might be a premium solution going up in power. Could this be a united platform for the future? Maybe, depends on the price. And then we've also got these other efforts at the lower end of the scale that uh, Bob talked to the guy Hans, who's trying to make the Mistex, which was the uh, project to sort of implement Mister on a number of different FPGAs instead and not tie it into one platform. So this is going to be interesting. Will we coalesce around a new platform? Will we go open hardware and support various different? That It's going to be interesting for the future. I think you're right. It's going to be... Um... It's definitely exciting to see, hmm. no matter what happens, kind of new things going on. Uh, but as we've said many times, it's best to proceed and uh, almost with caution with a lot of these things. And it doesn't always help to be uh, the early adopters, uh, oh. right, on a lot of these things as they come out right initially. Uh, because it's all, a lot of times it is about building up hype and then, is that going to be a pre-order for something that, that then goes to where we'll give you something in this future? Again, a lot along the lines of analog. I think everybody sees what analog does and just drools about the fact that they just tease an item, put out a pre-order for it, and then they get all the cash paid to them right then. Mm. And then they have a couple months to deliver the product. And a lot of that is because of uh, the way they've marketed their products the whole time. And... I, think, I that. think that was also my, my kind of point that I didn't uh, quite get to before about that the, the backing of a big company and why I'm a little bit wary of smaller companies. So if this has the potential to be the new framework, right, the new base hardware, we big companies are not scared and afraid like startups are. So I think we saw that with Pixel FX. Those guys are just so friggin' scared. Like, no, you'll be fine. Stop it. But fair enough, they've got real life cash flow issues. Even analog have real life cash flow issues at their size, trying to make expensive hardware and then sell expensive hardware as a startup. But then you've got Intel has no problems with cash flow. So, but on the other hand, Intel, not so much about the community just you know not really connected to the community sort of just making this board so there's a little bit of give and take there that i'm all behind the community making efforts but also i do kind of feel stability in larger companies producing the base hardware um, yeah i get i understand what you're saying there especially yeah. when the base hardware that we're looking at right here is pretty expensive and it's not like a company has I mean, if you just ordered a hundred of those FPGAs, I mean that's, that's eighty grand, you know, or whatever. It's or well, eight no, whatever. It's yeah, close to that. It's eighty grand. You said yeah, eight, eighty grand. Yeah, eight hundred for a hundred for a hundred of them, and that would just be a hundred FPGA kits, and uh, so that's a lot. It's I mean, it's a lot of money. It's again, uh, it's. It'll be it'll be interesting though to watch. So we'll just it we'll is. just sit back and see how it goes. It is. Let's go on. We've got the uh, next part is the continuing saga of the Chinese CRTs and how does that work and what's happening there now. Uh, Adrian from Adrian's Digital Basement produced a video this week where he was attempting to integrate some of the parts. So we know there are whole sets that you can get shipped out of China from Alibaba. We also know that there's a lot of uh, components that are being produced. And I remember asking Ivory from Retrocastle about this. And I said, hey, how, how are they making generic boards? How are they making that? And his reply was, well, they're making these boards that work with a number of... There are a few common tubes because there was only X number of tube factories and that those boards were working with the commonly made tubes that they had available in China 
that's how they could make a, electronics for that. So, Steve, you watched Adrian's video. Uh, what, what, what's your takeaway? Right. So this is, yeah, it's a fun video. If you've got the time to sit there and uh, watch it, it's, it's pretty lengthy. So he does go into a lot of uh, details. He sits down and compares. First off, he talks about how he orders this uh, board set and uh, he knows that it's compatible with this kind of low end CRT that he has. Right. Mm. And so he pulls out the boards that are existing in the set and installs the new set. Um, and there's obviously some challenges in there where you're the big thing is, is you don't have, you know, a, a set is is made for a certain design. So you don't have you can't use a plastic uh, set with like two buttons. Then then you get this new button board. You kind of have to have the button board then where he had it outside of the tube. Uh, but it was extremely interesting because he was pretty much able to swap these guts out and keep uh, the tube and I believe the yoke and everything just plugged into this new set and he was able to turn it on, get a signal, get some adjustment done and uh, it worked. So it was one of the sets, you know, he said it was from, Alibaba or uh, or however this this is one that's obviously smaller so they can ship it easier mm, than the whole okay. TV mm -hmm. but he didn't ship the whole TV just some parts or he, he just bought it? the kit you can go the on kit. there and buy mm -hmm. different chassis so yeah. that's what after we've talked about the sets before right it looks like this is what they're doing in a bigger scale uh, yep. where they've created a the new thing that they've probably created is that the exterior shell where they could slap that button board into it, right? Does that sound Absolutely. like something that makes sense? That sounds like, I, I believe so. That's what with the evidence or what we've heard so far seems to be pointing to. So the, probably the big interesting thing is, is there's, these are not um, being hooked up to usually really good TVs. Mm. This is going beyond just looking for it to be good. It has to be, again, more universal fit on the tube mm. and there's a lot more lower end CRTs laying around than high end ones. Sure. So that's the one they're concentrating on. It's not so much about image quality. Um, it's, it's more about functionality and them still taking old tubes that are probably just sitting there and now putting them in that new shell and installing this also new board, uh, which proves there are still people making flybacks at some capacity okay. right sure so what was in his video uh did he have a uh summary of the quality in the end was it better worse the same well honestly i went through he went through uh in depth and it does have a lot of um you know settings in it where you can make obviously adjustments hmm. to Hmm. calibration so hmm. if you have a very it depends if you had a very bare bones i've run into bare bones sets if the tube was good from this one this board would be an upgrade to hmm. something that just had no um maybe it was rf only or it had no menu that was sometimes i'll get into a, a menu and it only have four adjustments hmm. this had a lot of adjustments so he was able to go through and really get into that and adjust it uh as far as I'm just kind of skimming through things on the video here. Okay, that makes sense because that was going to be my next question. What would be what would be the repair scenarios where this would be useful? So if the electronics that we get more control options, maybe we could replace some boards, get some more input options, at least go from RF to composite. Right. I think that one of the things that might be the trouble too is with the boards making sure that Somehow the board, if you were going to do this, the board would need to be your region, right? Okay. You need to make sure that it's not just a PAL board or uh, it needs to be an NTSC board, which I'm sure there probably is. Hmm. But I would be uh, curious to see, and I think that he might go into some of that. Uh, again, I didn't watch the entire thing because it was pretty long. But I did get to get through uh, to the section where he had started getting into the calibration, which is like three quarters of the way. 
Uh, but it's an interesting thing to think about if you have a TV that, I don't know. I mean, again, we're going to need to, it would be nice if they would just sell their shell almost. And you could like buy the pieces to a CRT and then make your, keep your own tube and kind of build it like this. Like that's the next thing uh, is we need okay, to find yeah. somebody to make a shell for it. Mm. That's kind of a universal size for the tube. That's really, um, Okay, so even if I had, so let's say I had some old TV and it turns out that that tube was all right and that tube was compatible. Let's assume that for the moment. So are you saying that some of the difficulties that we might have, first of all, is that these new boards may not fit the old shell, may not fit the OEM shell and things like buttons and buttons on the front like, yeah, you could wire something else up, but it won't just, those other small parts won't just plug in. Is that where you're going with this? Yeah. And it almost begs for like, again, and that's what I think these companies have done over in, uh, that we've looked at in China. I think we're getting close to what they've probably been doing is they go in and they say, okay, we've got this, uh, we've got the tube from this, uh, TV set. That's still good. It's pretty easy to get a tube tester going and have it to be able to just test tubes. It doesn't have mm -hmm. to be okay. able to recharge them. You could get it in there and just test tubes safely. So uh, you could test tubes. Now you have some good tubes. And then you've got the boards that you're going to replace these old boards that probably, I mean, you know, that could go from anything that just, you could find a TV that doesn't even turn on, right? The mm -hmm. boards are just gone, but you could test the tube. And then you can also take another meter and you could test the yoke and make sure that it's con it's not broken at all with a couple easy checks. So um, you have that hardware available, and then you add the other hardware that's new that fits on it that works, but you need a new shell because that original shell is going to vary so much. And again, it's going to have the RCA buttons or the whatever buttons, and it's going to have fit for that on that shell. So th I think that these other companies have found a mold Hmm. that they have a shell mold that they probably can pop in the but the new button array and easily install everything in that shell and then sell you a TV that's just new chassis, new shell, old tube, old yoke. If that makes sense. Right. So actually what what I was just going to I was going through some of the information that Ivory sent me and there's some bits I get and some bits let's discuss about. So he said, uh, he actually spoke to one of those companies as so well. He said, the tubes are all secondhand that we know. Uh, he said, the tubes are LG and Samsung, uh, and they're very similar models. So it was easy to get a bunch of the same models. And he said, most companies such as Philips, LG, Toshiba, uh, Toshiba and Panasonic, they use the same standard of tube, at least, or they were very compatible. Uh, and he says, only Sony and Mitsubishi tubes are different, which I think we knew that already that sony uh with the trinitron standard is significantly different so that already says something there already that yeah your sony's are not going to get fixed in yeah, any that way makes me wonder man is there somebody trying to make a sony board you think or are they gonna what are they doing with the sony tubes i'm wondering now like what mm. what's their solution there so yeah. he, he continues on uh this picture, as he showed me a picture, is a Chinese arcade cabinet board, a very wide compatibility to different tubes. So, so those guys, when they've designed these boards, they've kept in mind the most common tubes that they have available. It'll suit uh, Panasonic, Toshiba, and Philips tubes from 25 to 29 inch, and it'll work fairly well with those. Although the quality of the picture was not very good, color wasn't good as an original board, but it can work. He finishes off here. Okay, so first of all, that's interesting. So the again, that's why I wanted to get into what is the the end quality of these. Again, yeah, I think you're making bring a good point. It's probably got color issues mm. more than geometry issues. Where oh, okay, yep. Yeah. I would think you get your CRT put together, and like you said, I would wonder how good the color processing and design is in that new board. Deflection is much 
much easier, much more adjustable and easier to adjust and see on the screen, you know, how, how are these being set? <laughs> you know, so it's, that would be an interesting thing. I wonder if they like, you plug in your signal, it's just looks like, okay, it's working, but is the color kind of off a little bit? You know what I mean? Like off and right, on, maybe there's some on a calibration scale. Mm. So that's a good point. Okay, help me with some. So the, the last line that, that Ivy wrote, and I, I hadn't written back yet about him. Uh, and he's a sort of, you know, again, Ivory is uh, speaking his second language. So sometimes I don't quite understand everything that's said. But he was talking about uh, the original boards generally fit that specific brand of tube, right? Originally, the OG OEM boards, you can't swap between. But the ones that these Chinese guys are creating are more generic but what i don't understand Stephen, help me with this is what's the relationship here with the yoke because ivory said if you change the yoke it can work pretty well you just need to take care of the yoke now break this down just from your <laughs> knowledge of crts well it's it's like an induction thing where um you have to test the induction of a yoke so the yoke is first of all step back. first off the yoke Which bit is, is the, yoke? the copper thing i've got probably okay the bit that goes around the tubey bit I've the pointy bit of the tube got something somewhere i don't see one right uh let me hang on one second i got one right here somewhere all right. we want to see it we want to break it down from the beginning what is the yoke on the tube and how does this because that is a uh magnetic part it's not a complete uh, electronic part very interesting to to break these down. We can see all sorts of weird chemicals on Steve's shelf there. Who knows what he's got? Oh, Steve's got a tube. All right. So this is a very old. Mm -hmm. Gosh, it's a oh, it's a tube. That's a Sheeta tube, I believe. It's from okay. a Panasonic. Okay, bring it up into the middle of the screen a little bit. Yeah, so I'm going to pull can... it up a little bit more yeah, here. There we but go. this that's is, it. That's it. the Look deflection that. yoke is this section that you see is white and shiny, copper. Uh, has a couple okay. wire, a wiring yep. harness coming out of it right there. It's wedged mm -hmm. against the back of the tube. And okay. um, so... Now, as I understand, the yoke is there. It's a magnetic thing, and it's there to point the electron beams exactly. ever so subtly. So this is, yeah, this points your beams. It's his, so this plugs in, and that's, again, a vertical uh, deflection, and like horizontal deflection. Mm. It goes through this, and, th and it creates the magnetic field and that directs the uh, path of each, whatever the gun in here is told to shoot, mm -hmm. which would be a single color on a spot. It's directed by this yoke uh, and ah. the voltage through that. So that's, you know, that creates the magnetic field around it. And it, it gives you like your edge, your geometry is all uh, when you're adjusting stuff, it's doing this controls through the yoke. That's why if you move the yoke a little bit while your CRT is on, the picture starts looking crazy. And if it's not set properly, like mm -hmm. it, it could really throw everything off. Now, the thing is, is usually you resalvage a tube and it'll come with the yoke most of the time like this mm -hmm. one. You know, you don't generally rip the yoke off, but you might find a tube that doesn't have a yoke. And then you would need to find a yoke that matched the induction output of the mm. chassis. OK, so the gun, the gun doesn't really aim. Is that right? That, so it's line by line as it's moving across so the gun shoots the beam right but the gun doesn't move it's the yoke the gun that's doesn't move no yeah, the okay. gun just hits the you just hit the shoot the electrons out the gun and mm. then that's being directed by the magnetism created uh by this yoke but it also has to do with the shape of the tube design okay. the the front mask you know it's attracting these things it's not just simply like the yoke does it all but the yoke is a huge part of that whole thing where, again, it has to be, you know, it's shaped in a way so that all this stuff travels in the right path. All these things connect together in a CRT to uh, make the magic happen inside that glass, you know, tube there. Uh, but this, uh, so you'd have to have, this needs to be compatible. Right. So we've got to have a compatible yoke. That seems right. to be and the you, real And you hope. need to have compatibility here at the gun or where the gun is for the tube which that 
is very compatible, especially with the, the chassis they're talking about where you can more universally put that in there. And it, and instead that chassis puts out a range of, of stuff that's suitable for this tube. Right. And it'll be doing the same thing, a range that's suitable for a lot of yokes, mm -hmm. but it might not be suitable for every yoke. It might be suitable for a lot more tubes than apparently yokes. Like there's some yokes that may not work well, I'm guessing, with if that's what Ivory said. Is that what you said? That's what I'm trying to, yeah, sort of get through what that means. But it, so, so basically you, you would wanna... just be putting the wrong amount of voltage in here induction uh, and it would it would probably just not give you uh, a picture on the whole screen. It may only like make shriek your screen where you can only make it like a third, you know, weird things like that would probably happen. So we need to basically keep tube and yoke together. Yeah, that's always the best. And okay. especially if you ever have to do anything because uh, readjusting a yoke, putting a new yoke on a tube is a pain in the ass because you have to do all the uh, yoke rings mm. okay, from yeah. scratch, from nothing. You don't know. It's all brand new, and you have to get the angle down there perfectly on the tube like this. So it's always best if the yoke is working and you're just keeping a tube like um, this is in my stock of old tubes. I want that with that because then I could just pop this tube in there, and it may need a little bit of adjustment, mm. you know, based on the boards, what the board's outputting. Then I can adjust the board and make it work, but I don't want to have to readjust that yoke. Because that is a pain in the neck. Um, that's a long time, a lot of work. Yeah, it will be. That's I'm now we're getting real deep into the technicals right. of how these work. Because his last line to me said, "You don't." The answer is, you don't need to care so much about different tubes. You need to take care of the yoke. So this does match a little bit with what you said. the The tube is just firing electrons. It's not aiming them more or less. It's just sending them out. And it's the yoke and other components as well that are, are, are doing that. So it would be interesting to know with these tubes that they're putting together, are they finding yokes? Have they created a new yoke? Or is it very common to get the tube and the yoke combination together and their boards just plug into that? My feeling is tube and yoke are probably together. Yes. I had to guess. Because, again, you need a whole le different level of art to sit there and do the proper yoke calibration uh, mm -hmm. with a new yoke tube combination. Okay. That's something that takes hours, and that just adds cost, and it doesn't make sense for a product that costs, you know, yeah, $25 a piece or $30. Sure. I would absolutely think that if you open it up, and it should be easy to tell. Um, mm. If, if if Barry ever gets back to us, <laughs> and he oh yeah, Barry, one. he didn't he uh he he had something. I don't think he had got back to me yet. Let me double check. Barry. Yeah, we'll see. But if he does get us a picture of the back, I could tell from that picture if it's an original um, yoke. Probably if it's a good enough right. picture. Right. What's the yoke situation? What did Barry say? Because I was trying to get Barry onto a podcast, and he said he's interested, but he's gonna get back to me. Okay, Barry the Enigma. I'll get back to you. Okay. <laughs> Barry's the mystery. Of Barry's three TVs that he's importing into Australia, how do they look? So that that, but that's it's circling back to Adrian's mm -hmm. video. That's a great documentation resource. Now, I mean, it's got a ton of views, it's almost up to like four hundred thousand. So a lot of people have seen it. Um, it does. I think it does. Maybe again, are we ever going to see something that's a new CRT? I think we're talking about what the version would be like. Again, it would be something that's podgepodge together with certain new parts, certain old parts. And um, I think here in the Western world where there's still good units working, mm. it's not as desirable as the developing world is where they just need something, I guess, uh, that's cheap, that's going to show them whatever broadcast TV that's 30 bucks. Uh, because I'm sure all the CRTs that. that end up there probably don't work really with their stuff. Hmm. I don't know. The, you're right. That is the factor that we, another factor that we still don't completely understand 
is who are these being made for? Because it said, oh, developing countries. Oh, they're sending them to Africa. But why? What, what are the cost? What's the cost scenario of them sending the secondhand tubes and TVs from China to Africa? Why isn't just some cheap LCD a thing? I just don't understand. Like, maybe, maybe that's really there's well, not enough LCDs in e waste. Well, I think that's a good point. I think that this might be a a problem solution type of thing where there really is nothing else to do with these tubes and yokes. If there is a program that someone could put together, like to put put them back into use on a new, Mm -hmm. like keep them in service as opposed to just letting them pile up somewhere uh, and just sit there and not decay. (laughs) They'll just sit there for hundreds of years. That's, I think that might be a key to it. Maybe there's programs in uh, China where these are being built, where a lot of this is subsidized to get rid of the the tubes. It's mm-hmm. like we need, we have. Maybe they realized, hey, we spent 15 years of having all the tubes come here, and then we shipped off a lot of those to other countries in this area, and now everybody's like crazy about shipping tubes because it's e waste and. Uh, you could go watch documentaries on it. It's become a bigger illegal smuggling trade than the drug trade is is illegal mm. uh, e waste exporting to uh, lower end countries. So mm. I think that there might be a little bit of that in where hey, it's part of a environmental program to reuse these things and keep them from whatever. Okay. Like this that. is a good thing I come out of it, kind of. The, maybe the conspiracy theory is that we can't just take old tubes out of the waste and stick them in and ship them off to Africa because that's not very good. But if we, if we make them back into yeah. some like, working set again, <laughs> and we, we can ship them, them off as a low-quality product. Maybe they pile up in warehouses or something and, in Africa. And, but... and it's still, someday they still end up out of... Our hair, I guess. Right. Yeah, as long as they're the out of China, that's all the Chinese. They're, they're care just about. worried about, like, well, they're like, well, we're thinking thirty years from now, and we yeah. just want all these out of here. So, <laughs> yeah, that's that's Very long game. There you so go. We're still, we're still going there. Lewis so, should have uh, been a dictator. I, I'll give it a go. I'll give it a go. <laughs> You've got your dictator beard. Mm. So, what I've been working on for myself this week is I've been learning about the power draw of servers. I want to, I've got my retro NAS at home. I've got all my ROMs on a server and it's just a small little, uh, sort of a very small little thing. I've got four terabytes of storage in it. It's great. Does my retro, retro NAS, thanks to Dan Mons and the other guys, uh, Cyrook, uh, who, who do everything. Um, but I would like to upgrade and I would like to upgrade to maybe a little raid array so I've got some uh, redundancy if one of the disks fail or something like that. So I've been investigating, uh, I want to just buy some off the shelf secondhand thing. And I see some really cheap, like cool old server gear. And to me, what this speaks to is what's very common in our community and, and in our hobby and our life, what we do is we love finding old stuff that used to be expensive, but now it's not so expensive and we use it because we think that's cool. So every BVM that you've ever seen, every piece of Extron equipment that you're using, it's the same thing. Uh, So in the same way, I've been looking at these old uh, rack mounted enterprise servers or maybe something that's a workstation and it's got this, rather than a regular uh, CPU, it's got the, the Xeon, and it's got enterprise ECC special RAM and all sorts of stuff in it that is now much cheaper than it used to be secondhand. And I see some of those stuff. I see a rack mount server. I'm like, oh, that's cool. It's <laughs> totally impractical. It's there, you have there, space Lord. there for a rack mount? Uh, yeah, I got a little closet. I could stick them in. There's this closet. I've rigged everything up so there's a closet uh, kind of external to the apartment where... But even some of these rack mounted servers are so loud. I'm like, I think the neighbors are going to complain if I put it in, in that. You could stick it, use it as a furnace too, probably. Sure, in the winter. Yeah. <laughs> that electricity may as well go somewhere. <laughs> so you see a rack mount server and you think, oh, that's cool. You know, I, I just, it's something I never would have. It hits that nostalgia thing. It hits that, 
that retro vibe and I think I might like something. And not even beyond the noise, I started to to get onto the idea of the power that it draws. And I've never ever thought that the power would be a thing before. Uh, most stuff in this space here gets turned off, so it's not a big thing. But your server, your NAS server, ideally usually stays on 24-7. And the thing that I've come to discover is that a lot of, well, those old, definitely the old rack mount stuff, but even these old Xeon workstations really draw a lot of power. It looks like a desktop, but it draws a lot of power. And finding out how much power that is, is is really hard. And it's just sort of takes a lot of looking at Reddit posts and trying to understand. And um, what I eventually brought it down to is some people will say like, well, this machine draws 60, 80, 100, 150 watts of power. And I was like, what is that? mean i don't understand how that works so all i did was go to chat gdp and i said yo <laughs> chat gdp if a server takes 100 watts of power i don't yeah. know what that means but if it says it takes 100 watts and my electricity company currently tells me that power is 21 cents per kilowatt hour do the sums how much does that cost and chat gdp told me that that'll cost me 15 dollars or 15 you know euros a month to, to run that server, which I thought wow. was very interesting. So even a good machine, even a good power consume, that would be something like 60 watts maybe, uh, you're looking at like five to $7 a month to run that, depending on your power. Now power varies greatly. Do you know how much your power costs? Uh, I don't know what the rate is. The crazy thing is for the last... Um, for the last couple of years, they've been doing surcharges every month where it's like charges you a little bit more. Mm. And, uh, I know that a ge generally an average month is like 120, $140 for my house. Okay. Um, uh, that doesn't, but see, uh, when I have, hmm, I, I, that only runs half my like heat. I still have a boiler that does heating and stuff, so that doesn't. That's interesting. Right, the oil we've talked about the oil charges. Yeah, so I have to show. buy oil, so it's like my electric bills are a little lower, but it's mm. not from. I still have to pay the other thing, so it's like a wish wash this for that. But I don't know. I'll check out what the wattage is per hour. I'm not sure. Power is a hot. It's right. It's one of these confusing things, and I I dare say what you're talking about is what most people know yeah i it's a hundred bucks or yeah. 200 bucks a month is what i pay uh they don't know what items cost or what their electricity costs or maybe how it fluctuates so power became a big uh issue here in estonia in the last year because when russia invaded ukraine that fucked up all sorts of power stuff around here and our power generation suddenly became very very expensive I'm not exactly sure of, of the politics and, and why it is. We had to disconnect from the Russian power supply at some stage and things like that. And at least the plan that I'm on is a variable plan. So it, it okay. changes by the hour. Oh, really? And I can actually, however, I can actually go to a website and see what the power is now and what it's going to be for the next 24 hours. So I'm just actually, while we're talking, I'm going to, pull up so you have to watch that right it's not yeah well right now we were watching it i want to say more than six months or last winter uh we were watching it very carefully because there would be some really crazy spikes but right now it's costing uh, no, uh what are we at what are we at 16 16 euro cents per kilowatt hour it was 20 earlier today and i can see that after midnight it goes down to about nine so you think if you're going to run your dishwasher, you run it late at night if you're really yeah. concerned about some things. Um, and you can uh, you know, get some sort of alerts on this and stuff like this if you, you really need to know if it's really going to bounce up. I can see that at 8 o'clock, the most expensive power is 30 cents per kilowatt hour, double what it is okay. right now. So that made me think about power. And I'm also now aware of how much it costs at each moment. And that's so going to be running nonstop. If so you have right, that. so you're if so you're going to run through those nonstop. peak hours, mm. it's going to be hard to even judge, right? Well, you can't. So I think what you 
well for me i don't want to turn my server off at night i guess i could i guess i could just set it that probably at midnight i don't know i don't really need it after that until i wake up at seven or something so i guess i mm -hmm. could um but i don't really want to do that and power cycle my machine every night so that made me start to think about power. And if I got one of these workstations that are super cool, because I see that stuff and I think like, oh, I want a HP workstation with Xeon and ECC RAM and 64 gigs. It looks dope. And it was going to be another hundred bucks a year over just in power over getting something quite equivalent from that's just a regular i5 or i7 or whatever is your your regular consumer cpu and just getting if i just find some old gaming cpu another part of power that i've understood is very important is whether you got the gpu in there or not yeah uh, so gpu comes into play in a server maybe you need to do some transcoding so you might have the file that gets put there your movie that you want to watch yeah. and it needs to get transcoded to a different format possibly maybe maybe not and then, as I understand, maybe a GPU could help there. But if you, like me, it's just me and my girlfriend, and we don't have many other users. And in that scenario, I don't really need a GPU to do those tasks. The CPU and the integrated graphics would do just fine. And if you then, so I would be looking to find an, a reasonable, not too old, i5, i7 system and I would actually take the graphics card out of it. I just want to use integrated graphics to not even run a GPU. And that seems to be the most effective way that I could build a NAS server, as cool as I think it is. Or for the nerdy ones out there, there are some of the earlier Xeons. If I go actually quite old, then some of those earlier uh, E3 Xeons have a much lower power draw. So I've really right. had to look what about upgrading or like what about changing like the uh on the last option change into a more efficient power supply i guess uh, as i've understood that... it's not about the oh there is that so yes okay so from what i understand and please call me out in the comments if i'm speaking out of my <laughs> ass here power supply makes a difference we don't want an inefficient power supply but it's all about what the system is actually drawing okay and so what I've learned so far is GPU and CPU. And the CPU draws a lot. So what yeah. CPU? Your consumer ones, and especially your modern consumer i5, i7, are really drawing a lot less power than older ones or server-type hardware. And if you take that GPU out of the system as well, and one of the big giveaways is I'm definitely, definitely, definitely not buying a system with a GPU that takes the extra power plug and like the GPUs that have their own power plug. Have you had one of those? Oh, I have uh, my newest graphics card in my mm. main rig has three power oh, yeah. plugs in it. Mm. It has the three different power lines from the power supply. Right. It's, it's like a 900 watt power supply or something crazy. I don't know. So I think, yeah, the power supply can, can supply a lot and can do yeah. it quite efficiently. But that's what you definitely. So if I'm having yeah, any that card sort will of take GPU, it's definitely not gonna be so power hungry that it needs an extra cable it should okay. be able to draw everything it needs from the pci slot so i've just been learning about that today and i'm a little bit disappointed because there's some of these cool old servers that i really want and i'm like god oh, that looks dope and because the, the old servers especially some of the workstations they're all metal and they have great industrial design and they look cool and i'm like oh i want that even though it's going to be sitting in my closet and i'll never look at it <laughs> I want I want the cool looking one. I don't want to just get some old nerds i5 that <laughs> I'm just going to stick some discs in the, the dirty case like Here's oh, like it's oh look rad. yeah. Around but, here they all look like Dells, like old Dell computers from But schools. that might be okay. Right, an old Dell underpowered, but if it does the job, it's got enough RAM. If you're not doing anything too computationally expensive, yeah. you're running some stuff especially if you're just using NAS or something like that. That's the way to go. So very interesting to learn about power. And because I was going to buy this HP workstation from this dude, and it was a really good deal. 300 bucks had like two terabytes of storage in it. Uh, one terabyte was SSD. Um, up th 64 gigs of RAM had really nicely upgraded for what it was. And then the dude ghosted me. 
we agreed i was he's like yeah i'll be back in town in two days i'll come and you know and i was like great i'll message you in two days i'll come and get it from you ghosted me and i wrote to him three more times yo hey man i'll come and get that from you completely ghosted me and i think i dodged a bullet because when <laughs> i actually learned about the the cpu the xenon cpu that's in it i realized yeah. that i would be paying 15 to 17 bucks a month of power to run that thing so this dude i thought i was really annoyed at him of course who doesn't get annoyed when a seller ghosts you right but he may have done me a favor in the end that's that's a high expense that would have been pretty funny if you never looked at it and you just mm. did it and then you're like why the hell is my bill yeah for my power up and you i wonder how long it would take you to put those two and two together <laughs> uh most of the stuff i have i you know the only thing that really runs is the retro nos thing and that's through an old raspberry pi oh that's nothing and that's yeah. nothing so it's that's uh now when i i don't leave the other computers running mostly uh because there's so many damn leds in them now it's just like <laughs> you go into a room and it looks like a mini disco balls going off in the corner it's just like impossible to get hardware without yeah. some kind of led light in it like who who came, who came up with the LED boner for, like, mm. PC hardware? Yeah, 13-year-old <laughs> yeah. gamers who play Fortnite. RGB. I need RGB. Yeah, isn't that a funny moment? Dude, when Alienware. Those... We went from Alienware yeah. to RGB. 13-year-old gamers who love Fortnite, and they're like, yeah, have you got RGB? And there's us is like, yeah, yeah, I've got RGB. <laughs> and then they're like, oh, I don't think we're talking about the same thing. <laughs> that's right, baby. Yeah, that's why I was like... That's when I realized I was lost on Instagram when I was following RGB and tagging RGB and stuff. And it's like dorky, you know, look at case my mods. RGB setup, man. <laughs> look at my case, bro. Cool liquid with yeah. the blood of 14 goats. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, like I've got an analog signal that's yeah, okay. It's, okay. What? Is it RGBS or RGBHV? They're like, what man? Nah. That's not a It's like hold this, please. Here you go. Figure figure that out. Yeah. <laughs> so Well that's fun. Yeah, but that's I think you fun. probably did dodge uh trouble there where you spend it, then you're like, oh then I don't know, then you're gonna have to figure out ways to justify using it more. Power. Or, yeah. Um, I think about this power thing. So um especially variable power ratings hard to run things all the time yeah i bet it's a thing so all right steve so we get into the top of the hour tell us about what's been let's happening in your local area let's do it yeah let's finish up this steve. show we're here in steve story time baby steve, steve story, story time, time someone has been waiting a little bit for this so um where i live is a college town there's a lot of college students here thirty thousand of them at least and it's this week is back to school week. Actually, today is back to school day. I got to finally drop my kids off. It was all wonderful. Uh, so I'm back to having some time without everybody around, just me and the dog. That's nice. But always in America, and I'm not sure how they do this in other countries, you have to go get school supplies, right? School supplies. And um, I try to avoid the big box stores because they're just hectic. So I go to like the office supply stores. And I'm there with my kids, you know, trying to look at stuff. And I'm laughing with Lewis really before the show because <laughs> in a college town here, it's 90 degrees right now. And for some reason, every, like, young, attractive, co-ed uh, sorority sisters running around in, of course, like, skippy booty shorts and tank tops. And uh, I'll just leave the rest to your lovely male imaginations i'm sure this is probably <laughs> like a male audience we're listening listening to us but that was uh so you just turn around and it's non-stop like that right now around here because all these college kids are running around they're all walking around to campus i'm half a mile from campus mm -hmm. uh, so that was interesting where i would be like trying to look for something on a list <laughs> like, all right dry erase markers where are they and then like you'd see something you're like what the hell <laughs> and it's like dad what are you looking at Dad, it's like the Christmas vacation moment where he's in there flirting with the girl <laughs> showing her panties at the perfume counter and Rusty walks up it's like, what are you doing, Dad? Oh, nothing, son. <laughs> so that it's that tough. was nonstop. And then, I, I mean, you can't get away from it here. Like, 
I was driving around. My son's 12 now, so I'm like, so, you know, we'll drive down the street here, and it'd be like girls just walking down the street in bikinis. And you're like, whoa. And I'm like, what do you think about that, Max? You know, because he's 12, and he's, like, going to the seventh grade. I'm, like, trying to, I don't know, you know, loosen up the uh, awkwardness where I just don't want him to come in and have, like, oh, Dad, I got a girl pregnant or something. You know, yeah, <laughs> like, trying wow, to avoid something guy. like that. So, so you got to approach these things so with him now. So it's to, not like, weird, yeah, because like. he's got a buddy who's, like, his best friend, and he's always like, oh, man. You know, like, they come back from summer camp, and I was, yeah. like, talking to him. Oh, man, there were so many hot girls there. You know, that's, like, all he's thinking about. He's, like, 12 and a half. Oh, girls, blah, blah. And uh, it's too, but then he's a completely huge, like, Fortnite Roblox dork. So they, <laughs> like, we're like, dude, chicks will never come near you if you don't stop doing that, man. Like, just <laughs> random noises, fart noises and stuff. So, anyway, back to these. I'm driving around with my son after that, and we're looking out. Uh, this is on like one of the main roads thousands of cars going on this and uh, there's college students out in a parking lot at the apartment buildings and they've got big tables set up and they're playing beer pong <laughs> which is are you familiar with that absolutely yes okay sure, yeah. anyway they're playing beer pong they're all in bathing suits and i'm just laughing with my son We're and these are blokes up. these are guys right yeah this time it was all guys so okay, it was like the sure. fraternity house. Equal they opportunity. Had, they sure. had pulled the, the couches out, too. Like yeah, from nice, the inside. nice, nice, nice. And it's yeah, like yeah. 95 degrees. Of course. And uh, so all that's going on. And it started to just bring back some wonderful, fresh memories of university and the university days for myself. And I wrote Lewis a note. And I said, don't let me forget about this little funny story uh, I have uh, here. And. And Actually, because I was going to say, I've got, up to it a little I, bit. I've got to dig out. I have an old photo of us, of my, me and my friends. We're at university, same situation. And we hauled the couch out onto the lawn when it was hot. And we hauled the kitchen table. <laughs> and the 27-inch CRT is sitting on the lawn. Now I think about, oh, that's a... <laughs> I got to find... I, I think you I've got that, that digitized. So yeah. We've got to find that photo of you us watching photo. the CRT on the lawn in the year 2000 or so or something like 99 so uh it's a thing you do when you're at university it's just fun right it's fun to haul you got nothing else to do with your afternoon let's haul some kitchen yeah. some furniture out onto the lawn into the backyard and sit outside then you drink all night and you start a bonfire and then you burn the furniture that's how it <laughs> usually finishes <laughs> at least over here <laughs> but anyway yeah the kids so i started to think about and I've, I had this reminiscent vision of a class I took in college. And this was when I was in, uh, you know, first probably year to year and a half at school, still living in the dorms at Western Kentucky University uh, here in the United States at this point. And uh, we had to take a physical education class as an undergraduate course, one and I remember the only real two choices that were available were like bowling and then this other class called marksmanship and mountaineering. And like, I, I suck my whole life at bowling. Like I can't even, I mean, I barely bowl a hundred with like bumpers on. I'm yeah. terrible. So I'm like, there's no way I'm going to get any better than like a C on bowling. I'm so bad. I don't know how to do it. <laughs> I'm not even messing with bowling. I was, that was like people, <laughs> my bodies were like, you go bowl. I'm like, no, man. I'm Cause I got to admit, Steve, if I was a, as a foreigner, as a not American, I'd look at you and think this guy knows how to bowl. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what do bowler I vibes. I right, got bowler I vibes. Say, but what do I know? What do right. <laughs> exactly. Watched uh, Kingpin and the big Lebowski too many times. Sure. So, so, okay. You don't want to take the bowling class. No, the bowling class was out of the question. And there was that was the thing. There was a, a wait for marksmanship and mountaineering because you had to do this in the first two years, I think, usually. So I think I had to wait till after the first year and we got into it. And marksmanship and mountaineering was an interesting class. It was um, it was early in the morning and it was only like two times you could get into it. So I got into it with a buddy of mine and uh, it was led by a drill sergeant. But he was, no shit, he was like a 25-year younger version of 
the guy from Full Metal Jacket. Who oh, Liotta, or I mean, yes, yeah, yeah. yes, yeah, the Liotta. legendary whatever Lee, mm -hmm. whatever his name is. Anyway, the guy who's on the drill sergeant's real, you know, he looked just like him, just a younger version of him. And you could tell he had to be really reserved for this class where he wasn't because mm -hmm. he said he ran like the said, now if you guys really get into this, you could come and join the the uh, college ROTC. We'll get you signed up, you know, come and do uh, this on a full time basis. And we're like, what are you talking about, man? No, 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 no. <laughs> we're just like, we're here trying to get this course. And this course was ridiculous. We got into it, and uh, there were really only two things we did. And it really was marksmanship and mountaineering. We went down to this cave under, like, the parking. No, it was, it was a bunker that they had off uh. campus. We'd have to go ride out in a van all together. Off campus, about half a mile to this bunker where the ROTC trained. And it was underground, and we had to go under there with these, like, 50-pound rifles. And they're not, like, they shoot, like, the 22 rounds, so they're a little mm -hmm. tiny. but And they're meant to be super accurate, but they're heavy as all hell. So, But that's literally what we did every day for about half of the semester of this class. Like, we did a little safety training before it. Not much. But then we'd go and shoot these guns mm -hmm. every day to the point where you're tired of doing it. You know, and uh, the guy would just basically give you the grade if you showed up. Okay. And he had a couple of exams and uh, two exams, one in the middle and one at the end. And I'll never forget the first exam. It was hilarious. It was a picture of an M16 rifle. Okay. And, and then it just had arrows pointing to all the parts on it. And it was a really crude drawing. And then it would just, you just had a, ba a word bank at the bottom. And you just matched the word bank. And, like, you did this from a sheet that he gave you that was filled in. Like, that's what your study guide was. <laughs> so it was impossible not to get 100 on these tests. Uh, and I remember, yeah, that was literally a whole couple weeks was us taking apart the gun, the M16, hmm. in the classroom and putting it back together. And that was all we did. And then um, it all climaxed with our mountaineering section, though. So we did our marksmanship section. It climaxes with the mountaineering section. And that is our big part of our grade was to repel off the seven story parking structure where everybody parked at the university, Dang. like off the top, <laughs> full gear. Sergeant was at the top. Everybody in the class had to do this. And uh, it was legendary because like we were kind of excited. We got to do it like me and my buddy and we did it fine. And, you know, most people did it fine, but God bless Lewis. There was this poor, uh, obese, overweight gal, <laughs> and she did not want to get on that wall. You know, uh -huh. she yeah. was like, I do not want to go over this wall. And you could tell she really didn't want to do it. And he's like, you want the grade for this class? You have to do the repel. It's not an option. And then he starts getting in like his drill sergeant mode, you can tell. And he's like, just do it. Get it over with. We've trained. You know what to do. And she finally starts to get over the wall. And she goes down and she just starts f f yelling, right? She goes down about three or four feet, just out of reach of everybody. And she's yelling more. And he's like, get down there. Go down. Go, go. You're on it. Go. Just let it go. And she goes a little bit further, and then no shit, she just freezes, man. She's yeah. just got this death grip, just not wanting to do anything. An old drill sergeant is up on top of the wall. And I, man, I felt so bad. He's up there, and he's going, You! You get off my wall! That is my wall! You get down that wall now! That is in order! You get down <laughs> that wall! Soldier, now! <laughs> now! Down to what? He's doing this the whole time. The girl is frozen. And I honestly don't know what happened. It was like finally he stops yelling. And she finally calms down after about three or four minutes of this. Uh, and we're all just standing there. And it's like the middle of the day on like a Wednesday. There's people walking <laughs> to classes saying, what the hell is going on at the parking structure? Do we need to call the cops? Anyway, she finally gets down the wall. Everybody cheers and so happy for her. And it's like... This poor girl had like a, probably a cha life-changing 
<laughs> traumatic experience in the class. In one way or the other. Like, one way or the other. Or for worse. So, so you had done some work, some, some trainings on smaller walls. No, no. It was just like all, hey, here's how you tie your harness. Here's how yeah. you wear it. And we practiced like putting it on. And then it's like the rope's going to go through like this. And you do this mm-hmm. all in the classroom. It was never any smaller walls. It was literally, <laughs> all right, we're ready. Now go. 70 right. feet or like it was like a, i mean it was like 70 80 feet down you know it wasn't i mean i w- i couldn't believe it like the whole thing was nuts and it sounds uh, like the, i mean yeah drill sergeant should have got us a i don't know if they ever i know i don't know if they do that anymore surely it doesn't not sound like something that yeah it doesn't sound like something that would still happen but he was trying to get us to join the rotc and show us what it was yeah. really like was his, his <laughs> one flashing moment of where you're like all right it's official. I'm not going to join the ROTC. <laughs> <laughs> That's his wall. It's his wall. You covered that my wall. Yeah. So oh my God. that was kind of the reminiscent story. Uh, not much more to it than that. But And you went down the wall. Oh, yeah. I had to go down the wall. Everybody had to you, go down the wall. Everyone had to go down. And you went down the wall and you, and you and were I able aced, to shoot the gun. I aced the course. You aced the course. Hey, he hey baby. Course. Of course, because it was the... When my uh, father, my parents were just here in Estonia for two weeks, and I was trying to think of stuff that I could do with them. And my father's an old, you know, he was in the cadets and some some sort of military thing when he was younger. So, and he likes to shoot guns. So we went uh, shooting at the shooting range here. Now in Australia, shooting and guns are highly, highly restricted. We've had, see what happens here, Steve. I just want to break this one down for you. So there's some countries where when you have mass shootings, they, and now wait for it, wait for it. Wait, they, they change the law. I know, crazy idea. Change, I know that doesn't make sense to you as an American. That doesn't what are you compute. talking about, change the so law? So they have a mass shooting in Australia. It was at Port Arthur. And then they change the law so that you couldn't have those guns anymore. And they had a huge gun buyback. With they, the government paid you to bring your guns in and they highly restricted all the guns. And here's the crazy, 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 crazy part of all of this. We haven't had a mass shooting since. Crazy. Nuts. I know. As I'm speaking to my American audience here. Mm -hmm. So, guns are highly restricted in Australia. Uh, My dad has like a a hunting license. So, he's not even allowed to shoot a pistol. And as I understood later, in Australia, even though he's got a license to shoot a rifle in Australia, he can't even go to the gun range and shoot a pistol usually. I was like, what? Not even at the gun range? Not even while the instructor's huh, really? standing right there? And he's like, nah. I was like, I didn't know that. So yeah, we went to the uh, the the gun range here and I, I picked out a selection. It was called Old Russian Weapons and, uh, from the Soviet Union. And it sounded like something that dad might like. So he went down into the bunker because it is in the bunker of an old Soviet building. And I went, hi, we're here. We're here for the two o'clock. Uh, we ordered the, the Russian package. And he was like, <laughs> no Russian guns. He's like, what? The email said we'd have the right. He's like, no Russian guns. I'm like, okay. <laughs> so uh, what, 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 what do we have? He's like, these ones. And there's like one package for two. And it had some modern and some. And we're like, fine, we'll take that. <laughs> <laughs> and we see in, like in the distance there's like a stag party there and there's dudes shooting the guns with like their flip-flops and shorts <laughs> and uh and we, and we did it at the same time like these two kids came in they must have been like 16 or something and like we were sort of the four of us all shooting and yeah, again it was only and dad got to shoot a m16 i think and mm-hmm. another two machine guns and a rifle and a couple of handguns and I, as i said i only understood later that that's an experience my father couldn't have in australia he couldn't legally even go to the gun range and shoot those guns and we're here in estonia shooting them in our flip-flops and yeah and i remember oh, yeah. when i was in uh in in georgia with my my friend Dieter in atlanta and we i'm not gonna lie we got a little high we had a hit of the vape pen that had some good stuff in it and then he took us to the gun range mm-hmm. two dudes with red eyes and it was like welcome in yeah uh, well, I don't care. No, no problems and what first of all what i loved about the atlanta gun range was that when you went in you first had to choose what weapons and what ammunition and they gave you a basket 
like there's a bar like a shopping basket a metal shopping basket and you go yeah i want a couple of uh i want that glock i want that pistol i want those bullets i want a few of those put them all in my shopping basket love it <laughs> love it love it love it and then we start to shoot and we're in the back of the range and the mm -hmm. guy's like do you know how to do it and we're like yeah and he's like okay so we're shooting and then in the gun range we're having a great time and then we see a sign it's written in chalk and it says, now you can try Machine Gun of the Week. <laughs> and we're like, fuck yeah, we're going to try Machine Gun of the Week. That sounds fucking awesome, whatever it is. I don't know, an MP5 or something. And we're like, oh yeah, two, two orders of Machine Gun of the Week, please. <laughs> and then we got Machine Gun of the Week. And <laughs> that's, that's like the quickest five seconds or the most you'd spend yeah. five seconds, right? Because you just it's burn done. it up money from the ammo, right? <laughs> it's done. <laughs> and uh, then we screamed off again. But to me, that was such the machine gun of the week was such a beautiful example of gun culture crazy. in Australia. And I make fun of you guys, but dang, we had fun at the gun range. Oh and yeah, that's in the south as well, like you are. So a little oh, bit yeah. more, maybe culture's a little bit different down the south. No, I mean in America, pretty much all over, almost okay, right. <laughs> everywhere. But maybe like the well, see, I would say the big cities, but I bet people are mm. packing there too. I don't really know. I've never lived in the big city, but. I know. I mean, I'll be. Uh, I've had plenty. You know, you always have a family member who will like pass away, and you'll be like, "Oh my gosh, they passed away. They they left four hundred guns." And you're like, <laughs> "What? They had four hundred guns?" And it's not even. It wouldn't even be anything like <coughs> crazy. It's like shotguns and hunting guns, and some people just. It's like it's like us. It's like they got into collecting, and for some reason they got collecting guns. Yeah. And someone's like the guys like. One of the guys that had a big gun collection in the family, I mean, this was like a decade ago when he died. Uh, and it was, uh, he was so old and like decrepit, but that he couldn't physically fire these, like for probably the last decade of his life, he would not be able to physically hold these weapons and fire them. Yet he was such a gunaholic that he would get these illustrious European shotguns, mm -hmm. uh, like handcrafted, like the company would do 10 a year and he would pay up like thousands for it, you know, in the five and six, five figures that they was probably yeah. the most expensive one. And, uh, and then, yeah. And then you're like, Oh my gosh, what do you know? So maybe in your it's gun culture in America dynasty. over like the entire, you know, there's all families that are like that around the whole country where it's just been like, Oh, they collected guns. They collected guns somewhere. And, it's going to be like 50 years in the future. It's going to be a hollow, pod, hollow virtual podcast. And your son is going to be talking about, well, but oh, dad, he couldn't even press the button on the CRT anymore, but he still had to keep buying CRTs. <laughs> couldn't watch them. The friggin' house is full of them. Can't even pick up a CRT, but that old bastard had to keep buying CRT. <laughs> This is a build a tomb, a mausoleum tomb out of CRTs and <laughs> shove me in the middle of it is what they'll probably have uh, to do. I can't, can't wait to, for your son to grow up and hear the reminiscing about what old man Steve, when he started to lose it in the final days, right? And how crazy he got about more CR, getting them more. Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> Spe I mean, you know, I'm going to the con convention this weekend to see Bob and a couple Retro other people World at Expo, Retro yeah. World. And uh, anybody who's going to be there. So if you're listening and you're going to be there, that's awesome. I'll be glad to see you. But uh, uh, I was joking. I was like, well, I kind of like going to these meetups because it gets funnier every year. Cause something weird will happen. And then I'm like, well, what if we do just keep coming to these things and we're all old men and somehow we make it to where we're like old men still in this hobby business space. And we can laugh about, you know, shank doing something or whatever. Well, Shank's got 20 years on us. So he'd still be going. He he's looks still be young. Right? He, he told me he was older than I thought he was. Of course. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, he's got a baby face. So, yeah, all right. So I thought Shank could still, he'll still be playing melee in the, in the, nursing oh yeah. Home. Yeah, or on a, a viewfinder. That's right. Viewfinders. We're, in a, and... we're in a chat. We're privileged to be in a chat that has uh, Shank, has Bob, and has Martin Heinfeld, uh, the creator of the the nine two X. Sorry, the one one two eight one two nine X card. Anyway, amazing, them, yeah. amazing technicians, and they're always just popping up with some. I made this today, and Shank has endlessly 
integrating something into a BVM card. That's Ib's obsession. That's the thing, yeah. To just find something, because the, the cards that slotted at the back of the BVM, and we talked a little about, there was a, he created the Wii version of mm -hmm. that. It's his new obsession is to create a BVM input card for every sort of console. So he's like the GBA, he's made a, G, a, a Game Boy Advance card that slots in the back of the BVM, and you can plug the game boy advance cartridge into that into your bvm these guys are nuts tremendous and worlds of fun yeah we'll see what uh what they all bring and stuff i'd if you care you can check out follow me on twitter i'm gonna post a bunch of crap i'm Absolutely. gonna be like taking a bunch of little video clips and things as the days go on this weekend um i try to make a vlog video about it because i just haven't done one of those in like a year or two or something so mm -hmm. uh i think that'll be yeah fun, make but... something when you're there that would be good steve maybe short little um i just want to show like weird things pops. behind the scenes yeah. or something where uh conversations with people if there's uh, a way you could do it cool that if you had like two mics and you could just like sit down like it's very busy so you haven't got an hour to sit down with everyone right but yeah. to way you could just like sit down with someone for like five minutes or 10 minutes, grab Displace Gamer, grab someone else, grab like, hey, let's talk for the next 10 minutes. That'd be awesome. Steve yeah, Fox. I'll probably do something that with like, uh, I can set up my GoPro and mm -hmm. um, yeah, should be able to use the uh, just a little lapel mic with it. Sure, or actually, like I've got a shotgun mic I could put on it. So hopefully... Uh, if I could, yeah, that's what I'm going to be doing. It's getting things I love ready that. for that. Just Steve asking everyone, how also you doing in a retro bunch world? Of crazy what tools. To? Yeah. Like that things. Mm. Uh, cause I know there's going to be some people there and then maybe, um, I don't know. We'll see what happens after dark. Maybe somebody will do something silly, but I hope it's just Indeed. not me. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. All right. Let's wrap it up here. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for watching Steve. Thank you for joining me again. Hold yourself back when you see the co-eds for everyone, for us. <laughs> yeah, Hold. don't worry. I can't keep up with that. <laughs> I was Thank laughing. You. I was laughing yeah. thinking about, yeah, I'm not, I'm trying to be the guy who isn't led around by his, by his mm. pecker his whole life. Ding dong. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> trying to make this head lead. Right. 40 years, almost figured it out. Thank you very much for watching. Check out Retro World. Retro uh, World Expo. Oh, God. Look, I'll just see you next time. All right, Ciao. see ya.